Owen Dalton is a sculpture cons conservator, conser conservator, a farmer, and above all, a rewilder. Reared in Dublin, he's travelled wild widely, hitchhiking alone to Istanbul and wildly, yeah. <laughs> hitchhiking alone to Istanbul and back at the age of twenty, for example. As well as living abroad in London, Paris, and Prague, he spent seven years studying sculpture in Carrara, Tuscany. In 2009, he sold the cottage in Kilmainham he had rebuilt mostly single-handedly from a ruin dating back to at least the 1750s using the original stone. The proceeds of this went to buy a long-abandoned 73-acre farm overlooking the Atlantic near Aries. Aries. Aries, sorry, I should have done my prep, my uh, phonetic spelling. On the Bear Peninsula, West Cork. Much of the land was covered in mild native forest, which, although very beautiful, was ecologically wrecked by severe overgrazing and invasion by a host of alien plant species. Over the years since, Owen has brought life in all its explosive vibrancy back to the land, with new temperate rainforests spontaneously forming, where previously there was only barren grass. Restoring such an incredibly rich ecosystem has taken him on a fantastic journey of discovery, lifting a curtain to reveal the whole universe of wonders beyond. Rewilding most of the land and high nature value farming the rest, there's been plenty of time to reflect deeply on the ecological crisis of bolding at terrifying speed all around us and on its solutions. He lives on the farm with his two sons, Liam and Shawnee, their collie dog, Charlie, and three Dexter cows, Maggie, Nellie, and Minnie. So welcome on Dalton. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, lovely to see you all. Thanks so much for coming along. So um, I'm going to just, um, Sears has already given you an idea of where I'm coming from, my background, and why I'm here and why I wrote a book. But I'll just, um, I'll just go into that a little, in a little bit more detail uh, as a way of setting up uh, for the piece that I'm going to read you out of my book, if that's okay. So I... I rebuilt this this 18th century stone cottage in Kilmainu um, in the the late the second half of the 1990s, and then headed off to Italy um, to Carrara for seven years. But before I went, I knew that the 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 sense of place and history and and land uh, that that there was a kind of a bond started to form between me and that place in Kilmain. And I knew before I went to Italy that that was something I wanted to expand on and enlarge and and go in, 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 in even deeper into. Um, so to, to, to cut a long story short, um, I pretty soon, I was coming back when I was in Italy, I was coming back to Ireland every summer and would go down the west somewhere. And I, I very soon visited the Bear Peninsula and realised that's where I wanted to be because it's just such a special place, as is Ackle. Um, but I guess Bear had all the, it ticked all the boxes for me. Um, and so after coming back from Ireland or to Ireland from Italy then, um, after a few years, we found this farm and it was a 73 acre farm. Uh, and what attracted me in particular to it was I didn't know this at the time. Uh, obviously, I was just rocking up there and seeing it for the first time. But I subsequently uh, did some detective work and, and and worked out what had happened. And the farm had been essentially abandoned for quite a long time. That the, the family who lived there, the Crowleys, had mostly emigrated to the United States, as so many people from Barra did. Uh, up until the Second World War, and then after that, they started to go to the to to Britain instead. But the fact that they they were gone, uh, most of them. I mean, there was one or two little old ladies living there at the end, but they weren't farming the lands. They weren't really managing the lands, uh, and that allowed the 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 there would have been small pockets of wild nature, including native trees. And they were able to spread out because there was no livestock to prevent the, the, the natural regeneration of the trees. So I think if you had a time machine and you were able to go back to around 1900 to my place, what you would have found there would have been quite similar to what you see now in neighboring farms, which is 
uh, open fields with livestock uh, and in the very rough bits of ground in between where you have scree or, or very steeply sloping ground or cliffs and boulders and all that kind of stuff. And Bear is full of that. Topographically, it's extremely rich and varied. So those bits of land that weren't that useful agriculturally were kind of just left to their own devices and they served as refugia for not just the trees, but all of the associated biodiversity that goes along with that, the 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 ground flora, the the the, the I would say the mycorrhizal fungi, probably a lot of the invertebrates, all of that stuff. And when the land ceased being farmed, that was able to spread back out and colonize the ground in between. So when I came, when I came, when I found the place uh, in uh, 2009, uh, there was this amazing wild native forest, you know, full of old oaks and hazel and sally, birch, holly, uh, mountain ash, a whole great, about a dozen different tree species. But it was extremely uh, degraded ecologically. Now, the, the things that were causing that were, were two, there were two major factors in that. The first one was very severe overgrazing, mainly by feral goats, which are, they're essentially domesticated goats that have been let go. And that's what happened in my area. Some, some people let a few goats go and they started to breed. And after a few years, there was a hundred having started out with only kind of like a handful. Um, and there are also Sika deer in the area and both species, feral goats and Sika deer, they're both what we describe as invasive species. They're non-native. They don't belong. They, they're extremely damaging ecologically. Um, so what that severe overgrazing was doing, uh, the first thing was that it was preventing the forest from regenerating. So any, any seedling that germinated was immediately munched and that was the end of it. So if you have a population of anything that's unable to reproduce for long enough, it's obviously inevitably going to just start dying off. And that's what was happening in, in my place. And um, on top of that, the, the extremely rich ground flora that should, you should find in a native woodland was completely absent. So the, the, the floor of the forest was just bare. There was mosses and a few other less palatable plants, but very, very little, no diversity. Um, the, 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 the goats and deer were also stripping the bark off some of the older trees, which killed them. So the forest was also littered with dead trees. Um, and on top of all that, this severe overgrazing by stripping out all the net native vegetation below, I guess, about my height, had had created the perfect conditions for invasion by a host of non-native invasive plant species, the worst of which was rhododendron. But there was about there was about seven or eight of them altogether: a Japanese knotweed and a whole bunch of others. So what I did um, as soon as I I came, I applied for a scheme called the Native Woodland Scheme, uh, and all I asked to be done under the scheme was to have a fence erected around most of the land to fence out the goats and deer. That took about a year and a half to go through the, the, the application process and to work its way through the bureaucratic procedures involved. In the meantime, I was getting rid of the rhododendron in my spare time uh, by hand working myself and the other uh, invasive plant species that were there. So I'm just going to... Uh, read you a piece it's the, it's the first bit of chapter seven of my book and it describes um that kind of time when we're into uh the, the the fence has gone up and maybe a little bit of time has elapsed since the erection of the fence in the years after the deer fence went up i was privileged to be witness to the most stunning magical transformation of the land inside. Native tree seedlings began to pop up everywhere and, rather than being immediately eaten to death, were able to carry on growing into adolescence and beyond, giving rise to what has since become 
new young forest in areas that had previously been just grass. Where trees were already present, a rich dormant ground flora began to reawaken, with a great profusion of woodland flowers appearing, many of them species I had presumed were completely absent. Tapestries of bluebell, lesser celandine, wood anemone, my favourite, bugle, primrose, dog violet, pignut, sanicle, wild angelica, herb robert, wood sorrel, opposite leaved golden saxifrage, marsh violet, yellow pimpernel, barren strawberry, wood avens, enchanter's nightshade, germander speedwell. All these and a plethora of others would burst into fluorescence in a rolling display lasting from early spring into late summer. The visual effect was one of wildly splashing impressionist colour about the blank canvas of a previously barren woodland floor. Slowly at first, but at an ever-increasing velocity thereafter, life in all its vibrancy was coming back to the woods. The many wetter open areas similarly exploded with their own palette of yellow flag, rab- ragged robin, cuckoo flower, heath spotted orchid, devil's bit scabious, sheep's bit, and purple loosestrife, to name just some of the many wildflowers that emerged. All this helped create the conditions for a great boon in insects, which in turn attracted additional numbers of birds. More and more, the whole place buzzed with flying creatures and rang with birdsong. The change was radical on practically every level. Seeing that coming to life unfold, it has never slowed, has often reminded me of the early scenes in a much-loved picture book I had as a child and which was passed on to my own boys when they were small. Where the Wild Things Are by Morris Sendak tells of a young boy named Max who's sent to his bedroom without supper for making mischief. As he stands there in his wolf costume, the room around him begins to morph, scene by scene, into a wild forest. The walls and bedroom, uh, the walls and bedposts become trees and the ceiling turns into a night sky full of stars and a bright moon. Max finds finds himself in a marvellous wonderland in which he goes on to have the most fantastic adventures before finally getting back to his bedroom to find his supper waiting for him. For me, those first images of Max's bedroom conjure perfectly the metamorphosis I have observed in the Bofagal woods as they have gone from a partially empty sterility and dying state to the chaotic, and tangled fullness of a healthy forest. Moving to Bera precipitated a full immersion on my part in the literature of forest ecology and ecological science in general that will never end. I fervently de- devoured everything I could lay my hands on, beginning with British woodland specialists Oliver Rackham and George Peterkin, Soon I was moving on to internationally renowned biologists and conservationists like Edward O. Wilson, Michael Soule, Aldo Leopold and Daniel Johnson. A very synergistic process was at play whereby parallel from parallel with learning from spending time in and working to restore the Bofical Woods, I was able to, to sponge up a framework for it all from some of the best ever minds on the planet. No doubt there were plenty of gaps in what I absorbed as I focused on those aspects that were of most relevance or interest to me, in contrast to a more academically structured study of the same subjects, for example. Nevertheless, it was one of the most intensely exciting times of my life, as I learned about a whole new world of wonder to which I had hitherto been largely blind. This included mind-expanding insights into some of the very ecological mechanisms that make our home to the planet tick. Developing out of that self-education, the most startling, thrilling realisation soon began to take hold, though at first I struggled to believe that such a thing could really be true. 
what I was restoring wasn't just native woodland. According to all the scientific definitions, it was in fact clear, very clearly rainforest. As opposed to the tropical rainforest mainly found in Latin America, Central Africa and Southeast Asia, the woods in Bofigal are a prime example of an entirely separate biome, the far more rare temperate rainforest. The main giveaway indicator of any sort of rainforest anywhere in the world is the presence of epiphytes. These are plants that grow on other plants, generally trees, without being rooted in the ground, hence excluding climbers like ivy or woodbine, honeysuckle. Epiphytes don't take any sustenance from the trees they grow on, depending entirely for moisture and all their nutrient requirements on what comes their way from the surrounding air and in any accumulated organic matter on the surfaces they cling to. They can therefore only survive in places where high levels of moisture arrive on a frequent basis in the form of rain, drizzle, mist, fog and so on. Airborne water, and lots of it, is the catalyzing element. The Beira Peninsula certainly isn't short of such conditions, with between 1.5 and 2.75 metres of precipitation per year, depending on altitude. By way of comparison, Dublin gets around 0.75 metres. Even more important, important than the actual amount of water that falls is the number of wet days um, each year, i.e. days with over one millimetre of rain, which in the bare which in bearer average is out around 200 or more, with relative humidity at 75 to 85%. Southwest Ireland's position means that its climate is largely conditioned by the Atlantic and in particular by the Gulf Stream, which brings a continual supply of warm waters from the Caribbean. The resulting very mild and wet condition, conditions, called hyperoceanic, are perfect for rainforest, which once, once clothed practically the entire landscape. Just as in tropical rainforests and cloud forests, with their great abundance of bromeliads, orchids and other epiphytic plants, so too are the trees in Bofigal similar, similarly thickly clad. Mosses, lichens, a variety of ferns including polypody and tonbridge fern, as well as Tunbridge Filmy, as well as Naval Wort, Herb Robert, Wood Sorrel, Kidney Saxifrage, St. Patrick's Cabbage, Wood Rush, and many others form a rich carpet on trunks and boughs alike. It's not unusual to find actual tree species that have taken root in pockets of debris on larger, more in larger, more mature trees. In the temperate rainforests of New Zealand, twenty-eight different species of epiphytic vascular plants alone, i.e. excluding mosses or lichens, have been found growing on a single tree. Even before human impacts, temperate rainforest was al always much more limited in global extent than the tropical equivalent, only ever constituting a very small fraction, perhaps a tenth, of the latter's land area. But its location in temperate zones also meant also made the land much more attractive for agriculture and therefore subject to far more drastic reduction due to both clearance and, and grazing pressure. As a result, it now has an extremely restricted distribution globally. However, examples of temperate rainforest do still survive in several parts of the world where suitable conditions occur. These include the coastal forests of British Columbia in Canada, the Valdivian forests of Chile, and those along the west coast of New, New Zealand's South Island. And, in what seemed the most incredible coincidence, I learned that also among them are the Nisna Sitsukama forests of South Africa, next to where my mother had grown up, and of which she all, had always spoken with such wonder. So, that, I hope, gives you some kind of a, 
uh, a feeling of just the 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 absolute uh, transformation that that has occurred both within the forest um, as a result of fencing out the invasive uh, herbivores and getting rid of the invasive plant species, but also in my own life. Uh, it, it, it's just been such a wonderful revelation to, to, um, to, to have this relationship with a wild place and to see it come back to, to vibrant, humming, thrumming uh, health. When, when I walk into the forest, particularly in the spring or summer, it's literally, I describe it later on in the book as like walk a traversing a living soup. There is literally so much life there and it, the, the life is vibrating and it's pulsing all around you. And it, it's, it's really, it's, I, I wish I had words to, to properly convey uh, how, how uh, magical and how rich it is. Because the awful truth of it is that the conditions that I found in the forest when I went there in 2009 are the exact, the exact same conditions apply in pretty much all of our remaining pieces of, of native forest in Ireland. So if you go back in time into prehistory, probably around 80% of the island was covered in forest native forest of some description and the rest would have been other wild natural habitats 100% of this island at one point we, we've gone down from that down to around only one one and a half percent now uh, and as I say pretty much all of those pieces the vast majority of them are ecologically trashed and dying just as my place was an example of that would be nearby to me. So the most important surviving piece of native forest on the whole island of Ireland is Killarney National Park. Um, and that is rainforest as well. If you go into, if you look up at the oaks in Killarney National Park, you'll see epiphytic growths everywhere, polypody fern and, and all sorts of other stuff. But if you look down from, from the canopy, down to ground level, there's nothing there. You might see bracken, you might see rhododendron, uh, and uh, beyond that, all there's likely to be are mosses because it's Killarney National Park is is severely overgrazed, but again, by feral goats, by seeker deer, particularly seeker deer, but also feral goats and sheep from neighboring farms. Uh, and it's been in that state uh, where Sika deer and rhododendron ponticum have both been identified and called out as serious problems within the park for a half a century now. So there were, there were biologists were already raising the alarm back in the early 70s. And nothing, nothing has really been done to turn that around. Um, and it's depressingly similar in so many uh, of our other remaining fragments. So I've been giving talks over the last 10 days or so all over Ireland. So I was in Cork and then from there to Galway and from there to Phoenix and Kerry and from there up to Dublin, back down to Kerry to Dingle and from Dingle up to here. And everywhere I've gone, um, I've been trying to visit some of those remaining little fragments of, of forests that we have around Ireland. And it's, it's really just, you know, it's, it's hard to convey. Uh, the, the, I mean, that's a two-sided thing in a sense. I was just saying to Porrick Fogarty last night in the pub, you know, you're, you're talking about getting in the car and driving for four and a half or five hours to go from one to the next one. And in between, you're passing through this endless landscape of just fields with cows or sheep and then blocks of Sitka spruce. And that's pretty much it. That is the Irish countryside now. And nature can't survive. The, you're talking about artificial landscapes in which nature has been pushed out to the utmost degree. 
And then, so you're driving for your four and a half hours through this denuded landscape from one of these places to the other. And then you get to the other one and it's full of cherry laurel or rhododendron or some other invasive species and it's highly overgrazed. And it's it's really, I, I just, I struggle to get my head around how we can have allowed something so precious to just that we just treat them as absolutely of no value whatsoever. They're, they're, they're allowed to just die away, including, as I say, Killarney National Park, which is managed by the state. It's in state care. You know, it has all the resources of the state and it should be there to sort it out. And yet they haven't managed to do in 50 years what I did in a couple of years. You know, it's uh, words, words. You know, I can't find the words to to express uh, how awful the situation is. But you know, I guess having kind of presented you with this really kind of depressing picture, I want to now tell you that there is hope, and my place in, is an example of how nature will come back if. All we need to do, generally speaking, is stop doing the things we do that prevent nature from returning. So in my place, it wasn't, it wasn't just the trees and the flowers and the, and the insects and, and the birds and all that returned. It was also rare species of mammals. So I had lesser horseshoe bats moved in afterwards and pine martens showed up and otters started appearing in the stream. You know, it's just... It's been such an explosion of life and it's in such stark contrast to what you see across the rest of this island. But the hope that I was talking about lies in what's called rewilding. So rewilding, probably you would have heard things about it. You would have heard bits and pieces. Many of, many of the things you've probably heard about rewilding are quite untrue. So a lot of the criticisms made of rewilding are based on complete fiction, do you know? For example, that rewilding is all just about wolves or that rewilding is misanthropic, that it wants to bring back nature and push out people or that rewilding is about returning to some arbitrary point in the past. None of these things are true. Um, rewilding is not about going back to the past to some point in the past. I don't see, I don't see what I've done in in the forest in in Bera as trying to go back to some point in the past. Although in so, in some senses it is, but what you really you can never really go back to the past because apart from anything else, natural ecosystems, if you understand truly. Uh, how they work, what they are, the dynamics. One of the most important things that you need to understand is that they never stop changing. Even if we, even if they're completely uh, driven by natural processes, which is rare here. So that's a complete myth. Um, the the one about people is also entirely untrue. Uh, I mean, you do. It's not impossible to find people who who propose rewilding, who do have an anti kind of a, a kind of an anti people side. But I mean, they're, they're a small minority of or tiny minuscule minority of, of nutters. I mean, I've never come across anybody like that. I don't really know. If, I haven't even heard of anybody like that, but I'm, I'm sure they do. They, they do exist, but most pretty much the vast majority of people who propose rewilding understand that as it is, Turning, turning all of Ireland and other parts of the world into close to monocultures, whether it's Sitka spruce or perennial ryegrass, that this loss of biological diversity also leads to a loss of diversity within the local communities of people in the area in terms of jobs, in terms of interests, in, in terms of you know, reasons why people would want to live there. And what's been found is that turning from traditional land uses to rewilding multiplies 
the the number and the 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 the, the diversity of job opportunities for local communities. So in a context in which many local communities in parts of Ireland are are going down the the, the plug hole, rewilding, we need to understand rewilding as not just about nature and, and bringing back uh, functioning ecosystems that, 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 that um, arrest the collapse of nature in Ireland, which is definitely happening, but it's also about bringing resilience uh, and and beauty and and richness of experience back to local communities. So an example of that, a good example of, of what I'm talking about would be the reintroduction of the white-tailed eagle. So the white-tailed eagle, they're, they're Europe's biggest bird. They're, the females can reach a wingspan of around 2.5 meters, which is pretty massive if you think about it. I mean, I guess it'd be kind of like from about here over to the wall there. Um, and they were extinct in Ireland. They were driven into extinction for about a century. And then around 12, 15 years ago or so, uh, the MPWS and the Golden Eagle Trust launched a joint in initiative to bring them back. And they were brought back. Um, chicks were donated from Norway and they were introduced to around the southwest to Killarney National Park. And at the time, there was uproar. All of the sheep farmers were, or a lot of them were up in arms and there were protests and all of this kind of stuff. People thought it was going to be the end of the world. Uh, they were brought in anyway. And it's been absolutely just, I mean, for, to a large extent, you wouldn't even know they're there. So it, it certainly hasn't changed anything in any negative way. But on the positive side, it's it has injected, it, it's given the tourism, local tourism, a great injection of, so when people come from abroad now, there's, there's an added extra interest as well as, you know, the things that were there before. There's also the chance of seeing white-tailed eagles and it's an, it's an extra reason to come. So it's been great for, for the local economy in places like Barry, Glengariff in particular, which is you know, at the beginning of Beira. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, Sears. Like I could bang on here all day, like, you know. But... <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Um, what I might do is if I pour a cup as well, I know I could pour a cup really quickly yesterday. So, and I suppose you can fight over who gives to answer what questions. Yeah. So as well, um, what would you say your expert subjects are? I don't know. Everything. I don't know. Everything. Um, yeah, that might be easier, actually. Do you want to take seats so you're, you're not... Would that work, Sean? Does this work? Here, and I might move this elector. So move that over. Oh, thanks. So what is the board of tail on? Yep. So any questions, really, raise your hand based. Marine protected areas, rewilding, bi biodiversity in general, nature, pot opinions. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that's really important to say is that rewilding isn't just about land. It's also about the seas because the seas are wrecked as well. They're overfished and Horik would be far better informed about that side of things than I would. But uh, generally speaking, I think you can say that a very, very similar uh, situation exists below the waters around Ireland. Couldn't you? Yeah, completely. Yeah. I, I do think it's unfortunate that we kind of forget about the sea half the time. And the sea is, the sea, if, if nothing else, the sea is big. Like it's really big. It's whatever, two thirds of the face of the planet. And, um, and the sea is absolutely critical in terms of, the, of our climate. Uh, it has absorbed an awful lot of the heat that has been generated. It's absorbed an awful lot of the, the, uh, the carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. So, so far, the sea has actually been a great ally to us. Uh, but we've treated it like absolute dirt and um, and it's coming for us. And I mean that in the kind of horror movie sense of the word. The sea is actually coming for us. Um, 
And I often think that, the, the, you know, some people ask I me, mean, what, what, what would be like something we could do tomorrow uh, to really address our climate and our biodiversity crisis? And my answer would always be protect the sea. Uh, of like we could stop we don't have to shut down fishing completely I think we could shut down industrial fishing I think has been an absolute catastrophe uh, but we could have small fishing and we could close off large areas of the ocean to fishing and remember it's not just trees that absorb carbon on land and bogs it's it's, it's uh, animals absor- uh, absorb a lot of carbon we're all made of carbon if you have a sea that's full of fish it's also full of carbon uh, and the other reefs and so on. So um, that's the kind of thing that we, and actually, uh, I'll give you the microphone. I can know I'd talk all day about this to myself, but we, uh, the Irish government, along with all the other European Union countries, committed to ending overfishing in 2020, and it didn't happen. We've committed to protecting uh, uh, 10% of our seas and marine protected areas. We, we said we would do that in 2000. We were at about 2.1 until last summer. We're at about 8 now. Uh, and we said we will do 30% by 2030. We're too slow uh, in doing all of these things. We're too timid. Um, uh, so if we were to do something tomorrow, we should really protect the sea. Yeah, just put up your hand if you have any questions. And thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I sort of it. Um, I was very interested to see how, what emotions you showed and what it had to ask on you, uh, how you were held without and crew being in that sort of nature environment. But I think that's a very, very important aspect if we talk about reviving. On the one hand side, we have um, the EU, which sort of spends a third of our taxes on um, animal agriculture, which is all rain the sheep. But on the other hand side, we have people suffering and, and the health deteriorate both the diversity both down. But right here you're experiencing that. And um, yeah, I would like to hear from you what you experience being in that environment. Yeah, I, I, I go into that in the book. Um, and I, I, I could say that would it be an exaggeration to say that I think there were points in my life where my health was at serious risk. And when I say health, I mean both the physical and mental. And that the thing that, that saved me was being able to go into that environment. Um, and when I say that, because I, I, I guess to contextualize that, you know, there was the, there was moving to Beira and the, the journey that I've been on, it wasn't all plain sailing. Like a, a lot of it was pretty tough, like, you know, uh, financial worries, a huge amount of stress, and uh, uh, trying to get pipe for permission, and then building a build. We had to build the house, and uh, the, and my marriage ended and stuff. So there was, and I had a business as well. So I restore sculpture all over Ireland. So I was trying to juggle on a huge amount, and I felt like I had a, a massive amount on my shoulders uh, for a long time. You know, and it, was, it wasn't easy. And during that time, I would go into the forest whenever I had, whenever I could, you know, for, for a few hours. And when I would walk through, because this would have been after the deer fence went up, so I'd open this, this kind of a gate that goes into the, into the, through the fence. And I'd walk through that gate and it was like, you know, it would be impossible to describe the, the, the change that would come over me walking into that natural environment and it wasn't it wasn't just psychological it wasn't merely uh, a change in my state of mind although that was a huge part of it you know immediately my my mind would just completely and utterly relax and all of the stuff that i felt burdened with um three minutes or 30 seconds previously all just dissipated um but it was it, it was more than that. It was actually physical. It was physiological. It was as if there was something running through my body. I've, I've never taken uh, drugs, but, you know, I've read about it. My guess, it's similar. Like if you take some really heavy drug like heroin or something and it's going through your veins, that's what I felt like. You know, at times, not always, 
Uh, it, it would vary from time to time, but at, as, at its most intense. And I know for a fact that I would have, I, I, I would have suffered serious health uh, consequences from that very tough period of my life had I not had that as a kind of a form of therapy, really, you know, on a regular basis. You're so right, Peter. You're so right. Because you see, we have only a very small genome. Our most genetic information is our microbiome, which is our bacteria in our gut, which are trillions of them. So if you go to your forest, you will mean hazy more as my talking around you. And you know, you're so right. This can feeds our bodies, this feeds our brain, or the black brain axis. So I'm not fascinated to hear that that delight is that you can describe it to be with. Yeah, I'll take it. Barry, you are done? So yes, I just want to know, like, uh, what you've witnessed in terms of climate change being so entrenched, right there, first. And like, I know Ireland will kind of somewhat protected from climate change to a certain extent. We don't get like the wildfires, like mm-hmm. ropes, like so near up. It's... Yeah, yeah, and most extreme. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and it's it's difficult to to be able to to judge what things seem to be changing to me and whether it's more just a kind of a something that's maybe four or five years and then a cycle of but one thing i have noticed certainly down where we are and i'm sure lots of other parts of the country is that for quite a number of years now you get this dry period around april and may that can go on for five six seven weeks kind of a thing with little or no rain um, and you get terrible pe- people set fires uh, and they burn on uh, they burn hillsides um, whether it's even at the peak even in the period where they shouldn't be where it's illegal um, but you know one thing that's kind of like counterintuitive I'll just give you an idea of, of some of the strange sides or some of the strange stuff I've witnessed uh having this relationship with a with a forest. So the farm, my gosh, um the the private ground, if you like, is where the forest is because a lot of the farm is commonage with shares in commonage, which is the adjacent mountain. And there's nothing there. There's almost no trees, um, because it's constantly grazed, you know, by somebody's sheep or or whatever. And so there are all these streams that come on come down off the mountain and run into the forest. And so in winter, what happens when you get these huge big floods, because the water just flashes off the uh, the, the, the hills. There, there, there's just what, what's called out where I am, Finon grass, which is technically known as uh, purple burr grass, or one in the end. Uh, and there's no absorption there. And it just, the water flashes down in big floods and comes down through the forest. Uh, and then what happens in these really dry periods is obviously this, that those streams completely dry up. But here's the really kind of wild thing about it, is that the stream coming down off the mountain has dried up. But if you follow its course into the forest by a little bit, it's trickling away again. So like higher up, it ceased to flow. Lower down, it's still flowing. And that's because a healthy native forest acts like a giant sponge and it's not just me saying this this is well proven uh, in terms of absorption rates of all the vegetation and mosses but also the soils when when they have trees the soils absorb so much more of the 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 rain during the winter and it really lashes during the winter and that's all sucked in and then gradually released and there's something so important in that. In, in a, a country that's increasingly suffering from floods and then droughts, you know, where you're either, you, you're either at one extreme of, of, you know, the water, too much water or not enough. You know, the, the solution to that and to biodiversity loss and the collapsing climate and so much else is very simple. It's bring back natural ecosystems, you know. And I'll just pass over to Barak because I'm sure he'd like to add to that. Yeah, I think that it's really important we, we maintain the climate dimension, uh, not only in our efforts to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also to adapt our 
landscape and our society for what's coming. And in many ways, we don't know what's coming. Well, we, we kind of do, but, you know, it hasn't really been internalised uh, what's coming. Um, there was a study done by the Environmental Protection Agency about what we need to do to our land uh, in order to meet net zero by 2050. At the moment, land in Ireland is giving off greenhouse gases and we have to stop that, basically. Um, and it's said that uh, we would need to cover our island in one third uh, forest, uh, up from where well, we have tree cover at 12%, we need to increase it up to 30%. We need to protect all of our bogs, re-wet all of our bogs, which is about 20% of our land. And we need to reduce uh, the number of uh, farm animals, or cattle particularly, uh, by about a third. Now, people, one politician described that as ethnic cleansing. That would result in ethnic cleansing of rural Ireland. It would be the end. We could all just shut up shop. But, um, so, but that at least gives us a picture of the kind of thing we need to do in, uh, just for climate uh, mitigation. But the point I think that was is very important. Uh, Owen, was, oh, what Owen's work has shown is that nature will respond, and we I, I will go around the country as well, and we say that nature will, if it's given a chance, it'll bounce back, it'll respond. But there is a limit to that because we know that even if you protect a bog uh, and it's absorbing carbon, if there's a drought and that bog starts to naturally dry out, then it starts to release the carbon. Uh, if we go so far to tipping points, uh, say beyond one and a half degrees, two degrees, will the forest come back the way that Owen's forest has? And this is the point I was trying to make when I was speaking yesterday. We don't have forever to be dithering about what we're going to do because we are reaching these tipping points where we, there will maybe come a point where nature won't bounce back. And then what do we do? I'll just, I'll just very quickly add to that, and you'll be saying, God, we're never going to shut up, but, you know, there is such a thing, uh, there's a thing called hysteresis, which is basically um, that if you push nature so far for so long, then you, you, it can't come back the way it's it has in my place, because there are no remaining uh, native or mature tree species or trees to, to send out seed and all of the other stuff has just been driven off to such an extent that, that there are no source populations to recolonize, you know. So, you know, and I guess just be aware of the limits to what I'm saying. Mandy, had you questions? Oh, God, sure. Uh, you, you have seen something transpore and sort of your eyes. So you are aware that, yeah, there's magic out there kind of thing. And you talk about how when you walk into the forest, it's like you feel it alive and pulsing and know it's alive. Uh, are you open again to believing in nature elementals? I mean, do you feel that? Is that what you think you're feeling? You're going to have to say, say what you mean by nature element. Uh, well, I suppose what would have been called fairies and that sort of just uh, beings that we can't see unless we've trained our psych ability to see them, but they're around so that when you go in and you sense something so strong and powerful and healing, and it kind of, I mean, have you ever stopped and when you're in the forest and going, wow, I really feel the presence of something? Oh, I totally do, but it doesn't, for me, it's not um, the kind of the supernatural. I mean, please excuse me, I don't want to be offensive, I'm just purely saying my own feeling, which is that. There's so much in nature. I, I don't look for any of that kind of, you know, fairies or any of that stuff. And that, that means nothing to me because the, the, the power and the magic is in, is in nature. Uh, and, and what I get from being in there, there's two sides to it, really. The first side is understanding the ecology. So that's the mechanics of what makes an ecosystem like that function. So. I, I've never felt the need to, to, to be able to identify every type of moss or insect that I encounter. But I understand, I know, I know all the basics. I know all most of the flowers and other plants and, and, and birds and all the rest of it. And I, underst I have a, a good basic understanding of how such an ecosystem works. So that's, again, the mechanics is really important. And that's one side of the coin. 
The other side for me is is a more kind of um, sensorial kind of something that I feel that I, I, I kind of like when I go in there, I just open myself up to it. Um, I open my mind to it and, and my feelings of what I'm being. And that is hugely kind of intertwined with understanding the, the ecology there. But personally, you know, that need to kind of think about, you know, stuff that people believe in, like ex, you know, supernatural kind of beings and all that. That's that's not my thing. And I find, like, you know, for example, in a lot of the forests that I've been visiting with this trip all around Ireland, one of the things that really disturbs me, and I know this is a controversial subject for a lot of people because some people think it's great, but you know, you go into, you've driven for five hours across Ireland to find this tiny little sliver of native forest somewhere. And then you find, as I said, that it's probably, you know, uh, large amounts are choked with cherry laurel or rhododendron. And then other bits, there's fairy door stuck to the, stuck for the trees, do you know? And all of this other kind of, what I would describe as tat. Yeah. And so I think like, you know, I could go on and on about that and on, on all the layers to it. But I mean, what I would say is that we really need to reconnect with nature itself rather than that find having the need to kind of impose some kind of a human uh, interpretation on it always. You know, I, I think that's so important. But just for, how did you keep the rushes? The rushes? Well, like what, what happens, like one of the interesting things, so in some areas where there was just grasses and say firs, gorse, um, as they turn, started to turn back into forest, what happens is that you get like lots of oaks and birches and sallies and all sorts of stuff coming up through the gorse. Uh, and the gorse grows up trying to compete with that stuff, but it kind of reaches a ceiling where it can't go any further. And as the canopy closes in over the gorse, it, jo- it just flies away. So like, as I was talking about Morris Sendak's book, where there's this transformation, that's part of it, where you're getting this kind of like certain species which belong in an open kind of a landscape, they gradually die away. Lazing up and yeah, I just want to wonder if you could a little bit about the opposition that you maybe have experienced in Bear from professional farmers um, and the opposition to be wider what people see it as against um, farming rather than his complimentary or law sign. You know. uh, I'll, I'll very quickly tell you um, that I haven't had opposition. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, I think if you're doing something like I am in a rural cook community and you're a blow in Dublin Jack in, as they described me down there, you know, I think the, the, the ground rules are if you understand the ground rules, then you'll be okay. And what I've, in my experience, that means basically that you allow, you allow people to understand that you're there, you're doing your own thing, and it may not be their thing but you're doing your thing and you're not trying to force that on anybody. So you're not, you're not, because that there is a truth, there is a, there has been a pattern in a lot of rural places of people coming in from outside and thinking that the local people are kind of ignorant peasants. Yeah, I think everywhere, a lot of places, um, that they're kind of ignorant peasants and, and the people who've come in from outside, should they're, they know it all and they're going to, you know, and that doesn't go down well. And, but if you're just kind of like, if you don't give yourself airs and graces and you're just, you just try and get on with people, but you, you, you also, you, you make it clear that you're not going to be walked over either, you know, then generally people will just say, ah, sure, you know, he's a Dublin blow-in tree hugger, but he's all right, do you know? And that's what you're, that's, that's what you're aiming for. And that's kind of what I achieved. Now, I was a bit afraid with the book coming out that that might kind of throw things a bit, but, you know, touch wood, Seems to be all right for now, but I'm just going to pass over to Porig now to to maybe. I mean, it's not that I don't want to talk about rewilding in a more general sense in Ireland and the opposition to it, but I think you know Porig has a lot of really good stuff to say, so it'd be worthwhile for you to hear his thoughts on this too. You know, 
Well, I was going to say, I, I work uh, at a national level. Uh, I work with other NGOs. Uh, uh, well, we're mostly based in Dublin, it's fair to say. Uh, and we're working kind of at, the, at that kind of political level. And, and there is, of course, opposition uh, to what we're doing. And I'd say there's, there's two main types. Um, there's the kind of opposition that you get, uh, particularly around rewilding. Uh, where, you know, the, somebody maybe is coming from a, um, a part of the country where they're, they've been living all their lives and their parents and their grandparents, and they have battled against the land for all that time. You know, it's been a struggle to make a living out of the land. And that has kind of been a war on nature in many ways. And the government has have been to- telling them since the end of the Second World War to drain your land, spray this on it, spray that on it, get rid of those hedges, do all those things. And rewilding is basically saying, we want it to go back to the way it was, please, uh, or, you know, or, or undo all of that. And that's, that, that's a difficult thing I can understand for people to get their heads around, because they're saying, we did everything we were asked to do, and now we're being told that was all wrong. So I, I, I can absolutely understand the people who feel a little bit of uh, an affront uh, to that. The other kind of opposition, I think, is much more insidious. And this is the... Um, the kind of pushback we get from basically the money, the money blob. This is the uh, the people who are doing really well out of our food system at the moment. The Kerry goals, the, uh, the, the the various co-ops, the exporters, the supermarkets, uh, the larger farmers. Uh, you know, uh, dairy farmers these days will earn over a hundred grand a year, which good luck to them. I've no problem with people making money, but all of that is coming at the expense of our environment. And also the number of people who are doing well out of the system are shrinking all the time. Most farmers in Ireland don't make anywhere near 100 grand a year. Sheep farmers are lucky to make about 10 grand, I think. Uh, The tillage farmers do okay. Um, uh, And the pushback we're getting really is from uh, those people. I mean, we were talking yesterday, we were out on the Mac here. Lots of farmers... um, We'll do what's what's asked of them. They'd be quite happy to do what's needed if we if we can support them through the advice and the payments. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that the Irish Farmers Association, the ICMSA, all these other groups, the Irish Naturian Hill Farmers, are fighting every single day. And in Brussels as well, their lobbyists are called Copa Kojeka. They're the European Union. They're fighting against the uh, climate targets. They're fighting against nature restoration law. They're telling people in rural Ireland that all of this stuff is going to mean the end of your existence uh, as you know it. Be afraid of all of this stuff coming down the line. So that kind of resistance is really um, insidious and it's really important that we can identify it and, and call it out, I think. Thank you. We have time for a single more question and there's one there at the back and then... It'll be tea and coffee afterwards, so I'm sure you can corner them and ask them questions then. If there's just one more there. It's hard to formulate the question, Ethan. Is there any clear in Europe for they have taken on this rewind? Um, I know Sergey mentioned at the start uh, that, uh, oh, and you're doing some high value farming. High nature farming. High farming, yeah. Percentage. How, how can you set, and this is the last question, this should have been more prepared for you. How can you that farmers will see you can still earn a living? How can the farming be involved in it? So that they don't see it as in, you know, an instar on their neck that rewild it. Yeah, can I answer that first and then I'll give you the microphone. Um, I think this is this is really important. I mean, ultimately, we've got some at a very high level. We have uh, we have to be able to feed ourselves, and we have to be able to restore nature and and stabilize our, our climate. Um, and we need farmers, particularly in Ireland, where farmers basically own all the land. We need farmers on board to do that. So um, we do that through. Um, Going beyond just paying farmers for food, we have a, a common agricultural policy at the moment that pays farmers basically for the kilos of beef or the kilos of lamb or the litres of milk. And we don't pay for clean water, we don't pay for carbon storage, we don't pay for nature. So we have to change that. And that has to include rewilding so that particularly if a farmer uh, wants to do what Owen has done on his land, that, that they are being rewarded just in the way we reward farmers 
uh, for producing food. This has been done in other countries, uh, by the way. Costa Rica did this. They saw that deforestation was, was uh, leading to soil erosion and flooding and all kinds of problems. Um, and they, they, they reversed it by, it's called payment for ecosystem services. So they didn't say farmers, you need to pack your bags and you know, get off the land. They said farmers, we need you to help reverse the situation. And they've been extremely successful at it. So I think we know what, what those solutions are. We just, we really haven't had the courage uh, to implement it because there's a pattern of thought in Ireland that we have to farm every square meter of land and it's just a question of how we farm it uh, and not whether we farm it. Um, so we do have to get over that as well. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with every single last word of that. Um, uh, shortly after my book came out last September, I got uh, an email from a, a guy in Scotland called James Shooter, who um, he, he works with... Uh, uh, a Scottish rewilding organization called Scott from the Big Picture. And it was basically, uh, the email was saying, um, we've organized this rewilding weekend um, for four or five days. You know, if you're interested, they, they, they'd they invited a bunch of people uh, to come on it and some of them had dropped out at the last minute. So if I was interested in coming, all I had to do was get myself over there and back and everything else was paid for, food, accommodation, being brought around, showing all this book. And so I composed, or I was up the walls, like the book had just come out, but so I uh, composed a reply email saying, oh, thanks a million, I'd love to, but I can't because I'm too busy. And I was just about to press enter to send it. And I said, you know, I'm actually going to think about this. And I ended up going and it just... It, it actually, it blew my mind because uh, I was brought around a part of the eastern Cairngorms. Uh, there, in particular, there was this valley called Glen Feshi, which has been, it, it, it's like they're doing their what I'm doing, but over around 60,000 acres. And that's just one of numerous uh, massive rewilding projects happening in Scotland and it was just amazing to see whole landscape so you're like as I say like what's happening in my place but over mountains you know land, full landscapes coming back to life with native trees popping up everywhere and turning into forest and all sorts of really exciting species moving in and they've reintroduced the beaver and they're talking about reintroducing the lynx and and people there i mean if you talk to scots people they they complain they say oh it's not it's it's a disaster it's not happening nearly fast enough you know uh, it should be much better than this and i my my feeling is like you guys need to come to ireland the treaty it's a disaster over there and it's only like if you look abroad so what's happening in europe uh this you know on continental Europe, they have a big advantage that we don't have, which is that they're connected. So a lot of the, the species that were driven into extinction in the past, if, if you stop killing them and you allow the, the natural habitats that they live in to, to start returning, those species are able to return, but that can't happen here because we're an island. Um, so that's one big advantage. But in a more general sense, like rewilding has really taken on. Uh, across Europe and many other parts of the world. And here in Ireland, what have we got? There's a there's some tiny little place down in the Bear Peninsula, I'd heard, you know, where there's this Dublin Jack Ian fella who's rewilding a, a rainforest, or so he says. Apart from that, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot happening, you know, and uh, we need to play catch up big time here. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Azula. <laughs>